Chapter Ten of My Doggy and I by Robert Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. Chapter Ten. A disappointment, an accident, and a perplexing return. But the trip to York produced no fruit. Some of the tradespeople did, indeed, remember old Mrs. Willis and her granddaughter, but had neither seen nor heard of them since they left. They knew very little about them personally, and nothing whatever of their previous history, as they had stayed only a short time in the town, and had been remarkably shy and uncommunicative. The result, it was thought, of their having come down in life. Much disappointed, Slider and I returned to London it is fortunate that we did not tell granny the object of our trip so that she will be spared the disappointment that we have met with said i as the train neared the metropolis my companion made no reply he had evidently taken the matter much to heart we were passing rapidly through the gradually thickening groups of streets and houses which besprinkle the circumference of the great city and sat gazing contemplatively on back yards chimney cans unfinished suburban residences pieces of waste ground back windows internal domestic arrangements etc as they flew past in rapid succession robin said i breaking the silence again and using the name which had by that time grown familiar have you made up your mind yet about taking service with dr mctougall now that we have got mrs jones engaged and paid to look after granny she will be able to get on pretty well without you and you shall have time to run over and see her frequently hm i don't quite see my way returned the boy with a solemn look you see sir if it was a page in buttons i was to be to attend on my young lady the governess i might take it into consideration but to go into buttons and blue merely to open a door and do the prolite to visitors and mix up things with bad smells by way of a change why do you see the prospect ain't tempting besides i hate blue the buttons is all well enough but blue reminds me so of the bobbies that i didn't think i could survive it long indeed i don't robin said i reproachfully i'm grieved at your indifference to friendship how so sir have you not mentioned merely your objections and the disadvantages without once weighing against them the advantages which is which are said i being under the same roof with me and with punch to say nothing of your young lady ah to be sure they'll but i did think of all that only don't you see i'll come to be under the same roof with you all in course of time when you've got spliced and set up for slider said i sternly and losing my patience under the boy's presumption you must never again dare to speak of such a thing you know very well that it is quite out of the question and and you'll get into a careless way of referring to such a possibility among servants or no honor bright exclaimed slider with for the first time a somewhat abashed look in his face i wouldn't for the wealth of the injies say a word to nobody whatsomever it's only atween ourselves that i winners to well well enough said i don't in future venture to do it even between ourselves if you care to retain my friendship now robin i added as the train slowed of course you'll not let a hint of our reason for going north pass your lips to poor granny or any one and give her the old message that i'll be along to see her soon it was a pleasant return to such a hearty reception as i met with from the doctor's family although my absence had been but for a few days the children came crowding and clinging around me declaring that it seemed like weeks since i left them the doctor himself was as usual exuberant and his wife extremely kind 
Miss Blythe, I found, had not yet returned, and was not expected for some time. But the reception accorded me by the doctor and his family was as nothing to the wild welcome lavished upon me by dumps. That loving creature came more nearly to the bursting point than I had ever seen him before. His spirit was obviously much too large for his body. He was romping with the McTougall baby when I entered. The instant he heard my voice in the hall, he uttered a squeal, almost a yell of delight, and came down the two flights of stairs in a wriggling heap, his legs taking comparatively little part in the movement. His paws, when first applied to the wax cloth of the nursery floor, slipped as if on ice, without communicating motion. On the stairs, his ears, tail, head, hair, heart, and tongue conspired to convulse him. Only when he had fairly reached me did the hind legs do their duty as he bounced and wriggled high into the air. Powers of description are futile. Vision alone is of any avail in such a case. Her dog's mortal. Is such overflowing wealth of affection extinguished at death? Pshaw, thought I, the man who thinks so shows that he is utterly void of the merest rudiments of common sense. I did not mention the object of my visit to York to the doctor or his wife. Indeed, that natural shyness and reticence, which I have found it impossible to shake off, except when writing to you, good reader, would in any case have prevented my communicating much of my private affairs to them, but particularly in a case like this, which seemed to be assuming the aspect of a wildly romantic hunt after a lost young girl, more like the plot of a sensational novel than an occurrence in everyday life. It may be remarked here that the doctor had indeed understood from Mrs. Willis that she had somehow lost a granddaughter, but being rather fussy in his desires and efforts to comfort people in distress, he had failed to rouse the sympathy which would have drawn out details from the old woman. I therefore merely gave him to understand that the business which had called me to the north of England had been unsuccessful, and then changed the subject. Meanwhile, Dumps returned to the nursery to resume the game of romps which I had interrupted. After a general scrimmage, in which the five chips of the elder McTougall had joined, without regard to any concerted plan, Dolly suddenly shouted, Top! What are we to stop for? demanded Harry, whose powers of self-restraint were not strong. What a west! said Dolly, sitting down on a stool with a resolute plump. Rest quick, then, and let's go on again, said Harry, throwing himself into a small chair, while Job and Jenny sprawled on an ottoman in the window. Seeing that her troops appeared to be exhausted, and that a period of repose had set in, the tall nurse thought this a fitting opportunity to retire for a short, recreative talk with the servants in the kitchen. Now be good, chillin she said, passing out, and don't hurt poor little dumps. Oh, no, chorused the five, while, with faces of intense and real solemnity, they assured nurse that they would not hurt dumps for the world. We'll be so good, remarked Dolly as the door closed, and she really meant it. What'll we do to em now? asked Harry, whose patience was exhausted. Cut off him's head, cried Dolly, clapping her fat little hands. No, burn him for a witch, said Jenny. Oh, no, we'll skeeze him flat till he's busted, suggested Job. But Jenny thought that would be too cruel, and Harry said it would be too tame. It must not be supposed that these and several other appalling tortures were meant to really be attempted. As Job afterwards said, it was only play. Oh, I'll tell you what we'll do, said Jack, who was considerably in advance of the others in regard to education. We'll turn him into Joan of Arc. What's Joan of Arc? asked Job. It isn't a what, it's a who, cried Jack, laughing. Is it like Noah's Ark? 
inquired dolly no no it's a lady who lived in france and thought she was sent to deliver her country from from i don't know all what and put on men's clothes and armor and went out to battle and was burnt burnt shouted dolly with sparkling eyes oh what fun we're going to burn you pompey they called him by lily blythe's name dumps who sat in a confused heap in a corner panting seemed regardless of the fate that awaited him but where shall we find armor said harry i know exclaimed job going to the fireplace and seizing the lid of a saucepan which stood on the hearth near enough to the tall fender to be within reach here is something capital a breastplate just the thing cried jack seizing it and whistling to dumps and here's a first-rate helmet said harry producing a toy drum with the heads out the strong contrast between my doggie's conditions of grigginess and humiliation has already been referred to aware that something unusual was pending he crawled towards jack with every hair trailing in lowly submission poor joan of arc might have had a happier fate if she had been influenced by a similar spirit now sir stand up on your hind legs the already well-trained and obedient creature obeyed there he said tying the lid to his hairy bosom and there he continued thrusting the drum on his meek head which it fitted exactly now madame joan come away the faggots are ready with harry's aid and to the ineffable joy of jenny job and dolly the little dog was carefully bound to the leg of a small table and bits of broken toys of which there were heaps were piled round it for faggots don't be cruel said dolly tenderly oh no we won't be cruel said jack who was really anxious to accomplish the whole execution without giving pain to the victim the better to arrange some of the fastenings he clambered on the table dolly always anxious to observe what was being done attempted to do the same jenny trying to prevent her pulled at her skirts and among them they pulled the table over on themselves it fell with a dire crash of course there were cries and shouts from the children but these were overtopped and quickly silenced by the hideous yellings of dumps full many a time had the poor dog given yelp and yell in that nursery when accidentally hurt and as often had it wagged its forgiving tail and licked the padding hands of sympathy but now the yells were loud and continuous the padding hands were snapped at and dumps refused to be comforted his piercing cries reached my study i sprang upstairs and dashed into the nursery where the eccentric five were standing in a group with looks of self-condemning horror in their ten round eyes and almost equally expressive round mouths the reason was soon discovered poor dumps had got a hind leg broken having ascertained the fact alleviated the pain as well as i could and bandaged the limb i laid my doggie tenderly in the toy bed belonging to jenny's largest doll which was quickly and heartily given up for the occasion the dispossessed doll being callously laid on a shelf in the meantime it was really quite interesting to observe the effect of this accident on the tender-hearted five they wept over dumps most genuine tears they begged his pardon implored his forgiveness in the most earnest tones and touching terms they took turn about in watching by his sick bed they held lint and lotion with superhuman solemnity while i dressed his wounded limb and they fed him with the most tender solicitude in short they came out quite in a new and sympathetic light and soon began to play at sick nursing with each other this involved a good deal of pretended sickness and for a long time after that it was no uncommon thing for visitors to the nursery to find three of the five down with measles whooping cough or fever while the fourth acted doctor and the fifth nurse the event however gave them a lesson in gentleness to dumb animals which they never afterwards forgot 
and which some of my boy readers would do well to remember with a laudable effort to improve the occasion mrs mctougall carefully printed in huge letters and elaborately illuminated the sentence be kind to doggy and hung it up in the nursery thereupon cardboard pencils paints and scissors were in immediate demand and soon after there appeared on the walls in hideously bad but highly ornamental letters the words be kind to caddy this was followed by be kind to polly which instantly suggested be kind to dolly and so by one means or another the lesson of kindness was driven home soon after this event dr mctougall moved into a new house in the same street i became regularly established as his partner and robin slider entered on his duties as page in buttons it is right to observe here that in deference to his prejudices the material of his garments was not blue but dark gray it was distinctly arranged however that robin was to go home as he called it to be with mrs willis at nights on no other condition would he agree to enter the doctor's service and i found on talking over the subject with mrs willis herself that she had become so fond of the boy that it would have been sheer cruelty to part them in short it was a case of mutual love at first sight no two individuals seemed more unlikely to draw together than the meek gentle old lady and the dashing harum scarum boy yet so it was my dear she always spoke to me now as if i had been her son this waif as people would call him has clearly been sent to me as a comfort in the midst of all but overwhelming sorrow and i believe too that i have been sent to draw the dear boy to jesus you should hear what long and pleasant talks we have about him and the bible and the better land sometimes indeed i am glad to hear you say so granny and also surprised because although i believe the boy to be well disposed i have seldom been able to get him to open his lips to me on religious subjects ah but he opens his lips to me doctor and reads to me many a long chapter out of the blessed word reads can he read ay can he not so badly considering that i only began to teach him two or three months ago but he knew his letters when we began and could spell out a few words he's very quick you see and a dear boy soon afterwards we made this arrangement with robin more convenient for all parties by bringing mrs willis over to a better lodging in one of the small back streets not far from the doctor's new residence i now began to devote much of my time to the study of chemistry not only because it suited dr mctougall that i should do so but because i had conceived a great liking for that science and entertained some thoughts of devoting myself to it almost exclusively in the various experiments connected therewith i was most ably and i may add delightedly assisted by robin slider i was also greatly amused by and induced to philosophize not a little on the peculiar cast of the boy's mind the pleasure obviously afforded to him by the uncertainty as to results and experiments was very great the probability of a miscarriage created in him intense interest i will not say hope the ignorance of what was coming kept him in a constant flutter of subdued excitement, and the astounding results, even sometimes to myself, of some of my combinations kept him in a perpetual simmer of expectation. But after long observation, I have come to the deliberate conclusion that nothing whatever gave Robin such ineffable joy as an explosion a crash a burst a general reduction of anything to instantaneous and elemental ruin was so dear to him that i verily believe he would have taken his chance and stood by if i had proposed to blow the roof off dr mctougall's mansion nay i almost think that if that remarkable waif had been set on a bombshell and blown to atoms he would have retired from this life in a state of supreme satisfaction while my mind was thus agreeably concentrated on the pursuit of science it received a rude but pleasing yet particularly distracting shock by the return of lily blythe 
the extent to which this governess was worshipped by the whole household was wonderful almost idolatrous need i say that i joined in the worship and that dumps and robin followed suit i think not and yet there was something strange something peculiar something unaccountable about miss blythe's manner which i could by no means understand End of chapter 10